your nation, your province, your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News Weekend Edition with Jeanette Roche. Hello, thanks for joining us. Following this long weekend, it looks like Alberta students will be returning to the classroom on Tuesday, with the exception of those in the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, where COVID cases were the worst in the country recently. Alberta's Chief Medical Officer of Health has given the green light, though, to the rest of the province after announcing that Alberta has reached a COVID vaccination milestone with more than a half of the population over the age of 12 having received at least one shot. Dr. Dina Hinshaw says new case numbers are dropping, but the province's positivity rate is still a concern. The province went back into stricter lockdown mode on May 4th, which included keeping all students at home for online learning. And speaking of kids, pediatricians across southern Alberta are working together to bring the very first vaccine confidence clinic to the province. Family physicians are encouraged to refer parents and their children. With kids of age 12 and up being eligible for the shot, many parents have questions. A southern Alberta pediatric infectious disease specialist says the most common concern for parents is safety. People are concerned about long-term effects. People are concerned about um, was this shown to, to work in children? Was it shown to protect kids? Is it safe for them to have it? And then the other really big question is, why do kids need to have this vaccine? What can this vaccine, what, what does protection with this vaccine mean for different kids? Though most children have mild disease with COVID, not everybody does. So we have seen kids have severe disease, be hospitalized, and we've seen deaths as well. We're also seeing that kids may have a mild disease and then weeks later have a multi-system inflammation from COVID. So there is definitely that personal protection need that this vaccine can provide. The clinic will be hosted online through Virtual Kids in partnership with Organization 19 to Zero and the Vaccine Hesitancy Clinic at the Alberta's Children's Hospital. It was one of the most neighborly acts of kindness. First Nations people in Montana with an excess of COVID vaccinations decided to share them with their Canadian neighbors in Alberta. I visited the Carway border crossing where the clinic was taking place to bring you this report. It's a sight we haven't seen in more than a year. Amidst the backdrop of the Rocky Mountains sits a line of cars full of Canadians waiting to cross the carway border into neighboring Montana. Albertans, like Geraldine Smith, anxious to get a second shot of the COVID vaccine. We are just a little nervous about waiting for four months. And so that's why we come. My husband has had Crohn's for 30 years. He's on a biologic. And so we're not sure that the vaccine, the first dose, will be enough to get us through. Uh, are you guys getting Pfizer or Moderna? Pfizer. This neighborly kindness began with an excess supply of vaccines in Montana's Enscampe Begani Nation that were about to expire. With 95% of them already vaccinated, they offered it up to Canadians. And working with the state of Montana and the doctor that has... Um, offered uh, more doses that the, Mon the state of Montana wants to open up for Albertans. And so we'll work with them um, and and Amskapi um, Bigani uh, will continue to provide their um, excess doses to our Blackfoot members and, and the public. So we don't know how much longer, but, you know, really hoping that um, we start to see uh, more availability of second doses in Alberta and this is what a lot of people are coming for is second dose. I just saw on Facebook that they had a short line today and I figured if no one else is going to go I might as well go get a vaccine and get all up to date. This will be my second one actually. So I have no faith in our federal system so um, I think he's um, f failed in procuring a vaccine supply uh, for all of Canada. So um, because I have no faith in that, I'm down here to try and look after myself. Canadians getting vaccinated will receive papers to show that they actually got their shot in the arm today. They will then be required to turn right around, cross through that border crossing right behind me. Now those papers will exempt them from that two-week quarantine period required by the Canadian government. I am so thankful for the U.S. and the Blackfoot Nation opening up to us as fellow Canadians because 
I think that that's like to give us free vaccinations. We talked to a young fellow um, that came and he said they just want everything back to normal. And so do we. So, I mean, how North American is that? Coming up after the break, Alberta has hiked up the price of hiking in the Rockies. Plus, did the government actually propose spying on campers with drones? We break it all down for you next. Stay with us. Welcome back. What's more Albertan than rodeos? Well, these days, because of COVID, they're actually not allowed, but one Albertan named Ty Northcott decided to go ahead and organize one on his property in Bowdoin, Alberta. He did it because his business was struggling and he even had to sell off some of his livestock to get by. Well, he got fined for violating restrictions, but is now planning another rodeo for Canada Day. Here to talk about this, among other top stories from the province, is Dave Naylor, who is the editor at the Western Standard. Dave, it's so great to have you with us today. Now, you interviewed Northcott, so tell us more about this. He's been in uh, the rodeo business his entire life, but he's just at, he's, at, he's had enough. He's at the end of his rope. This is the third lockdown he's had to, uh, uh, to go through. Uh, he's lost 50% of his livestock because of the, you know, the cost is, is high to feed these animals. Uh, he calls them his athletes uh, during the winter months. Uh, you know, there's no money coming in. He makes his money during the rodeo. So when the lockdowns hit, he'd had enough and he uh, organized his own. He called it the No More Lockdowns Rodeo, uh, UCP, or not the UCP, AHS. Uh, Alberta Health Services tried desperately to stop him as as did the RCMP. They forced him to move the location of the rodeo. So he ended up holding it on his uh, his own land near Bowdoin. And it drew 4,000 uh, fans uh, over the, the two-day period. So it was a success as far as rodeo goes. Dave, let's talk a little bit about what's going on with drive-ins and video concerts. So, uh, you know, Alberta Health has been coming down hard on people doing this, but yet just this past week, um, they sort of lifted that and are allowing drive-ins. So what's going on there? It's another health services debacle, uh, uh, Jeanette. Uh, there was a charity group in High River that wanted to put on a family drive-in. They were going to show uh, Aladdin. Uh, they charge people 40 bucks a family to come in, uh, you know, make sure you respect all the COVID regulations. Uh, they would have a food truck there if anybody uh, was interested in eating and then the money would go to charity. Uh, but the AHS the day before came in and said, no, we're shutting you down. They did the same thing to the uh, drive-in that was going to go uh, on at the Sutina lands uh, also on Friday and Saturday. And they, they shut that down too. But ironically, they let one go ahead in uh, in Grand Prairie that was in celebration of nurses. It was National Nurses Week uh, last week, uh, Jeanette, and they, they put on a showing of uh, uh, the medical comedy Patch Adams uh, for all the nurses up in Grand Prairie. That was also a charity event, but, but they let that one go ahead. So I guess what's good for nurses is not good for uh, High River Charities and uh, Sutina Charities. So. Monday morning, the first thing Dr. Dina Henshaw said was, uh, oh, we're changing the rules, drive-ins are okay. Uh, so that uh, may or may not have been spurred by the Sutina people saying, we're going ahead next weekend uh, with or without permission, so. Camping season is upon us and a big change is about to come into effect here at Alberta. So suddenly beautiful Kananaskis country where it used to be free to get in now has a fee. Came as a bit of a shock, a lot of anger on uh, uh, social media, people thought it should be uh, free as sort of a legacy park uh, as a gift to Albertans. Uh, the UCP says uh, that they're going to turn all the money around and plow it back into the park. They're going to uh, improve the trails there and uh, increase uh, enforcement, hire more uh, rangers. Uh, you know, there have been uh, some awful pictures come out of there in the last year of, of uh, you know trash strewn all over uh, crowded areas. And the, the government made it clear that on some weekends, you know, it's dangerous because there's so many cars parked along the side of the highway. Parking lots are overflowing. They had more than 4 million visitors last year, an incredible, an incredible number, uh, because we couldn't go anywhere else, could we, Jeanette? Let's touch for a second here on this spy in the sky story that you recently did. This is my favorite story of the week, uh, Jeanette, just because it's so absurd. Uh, the government put out a request for proposal last Friday 
They were looking for uh, drone operators to uh, spy on long weekend campers in Alberta, believe it or not. Uh, they would launch the drone and uh, buzz over uh, campsites looking for, uh, I guess, pop you know, populations that were, were uh, outlawed. You can currently only have five people in an outdoor gathering. Uh, hopefully it's going to be expanded to 10 soon. But they're going to be looking for breaches in there. They're going to be looking for campfire breaches. Environment Minister Jason Nixon had this desk on his desk Monday morning, and he looked on it in horror and uh, immediately canceled the project, said he didn't know anything about it, uh, said it was just bureaucrats uh, gone wild, I guess, and, uh, and uh, grounded it before it even took off. Dave Naylor of the Western Standard, thanks so much for joining me today. Well, we need to take a short break, but we'll be right back with much more. Keep it right here. Welcome back. Alberta has announced some new COVID-19 quarantine rules. Fully vaccinated Albertans no longer have to quarantine if they're exposed to COVID and are not showing any symptoms. And people who have had one shot can have their isolation time reduced. Until this past Thursday, people were legally required to quarantine for 14 days when a close contact was confirmed to have been infected with the virus. All of the other restrictions still apply to people who haven't had any vaccines and those returning from international travel. Well, here's some startling statistics. Health Canada says that as of May 13th, uh, 740 fully vaccinated people have contracted COVID-19. It also says almost 13 and a half thousand people who received their first dose were infected. The department says the stats come from nine provinces that submitted data. It takes about 14 days after the first dose and seven days after the second for the immunity to take effect. Health Canada says 443 people were hospitalized with COVID-19 for two weeks or more after receiving their first dose. Of that group, 95 Canadians died. Health Canada says 32 were hospitalized at least a week after receiving their second dose with 13 people dying. In Alberta, it appears as though some people may be attempting to prevent others from receiving their vaccination shots. In a tweet on Thursday, Alberta Health Services said they were aware of people on social media who are claiming to have booked multiple vaccination appointments in an attempt to prevent others from receiving their dose. AHS says they have shared with law enforcement and are ensuring that participating pharmacies are aware of these claims. Officials say they have systems in place to prevent double bookings and are also watching for no-show numbers to determine if false bookings are being made. AHS says so far they have not seen an increase in no-shows. Well, he put his name in the running for mayor and ended up facing charges for violating provincial COVID laws. Police allege Calgary mayoral candidate Kevin Johnston was in violation of a court of Queen's bench order when he attended an illegal gathering last weekend. The order imposes compliance with public health restrictions on organizers of events, including attendance limits, masking and physical distancing. And on May 16th, yet another Alberta pastor was arrested for breaking public health orders. This time it was Calgary pastor Tim, Tim Stevens of Fairview Baptist Church. He was taken into custody following his church service and spent two days in jail. According to his lawyers with the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, Pastor Tim's arrest was illegal. So our own Hal Roberts asked his lawyers, how could this happen? John, how was it illegal if Pastor Tim was allegedly breaking public health orders? The arrest was illegal because police can only arrest you uh, for breaking a public health order if the police have uh, an injunction, a court injunction that authorizes the police to arrest you immediately and toss you in jail immediately. Without an injunction, what police can do is they can issue uh, a $2,000 ticket but then they don't arrest you and toss you in jail and you have the right to plead not guilty and defend yourself against the $2,000 ticket. And you actually have the right to force the government to produce medical and scientific evidence in court to try to justify its public health measures. So 
when the police arrested uh, Pastor Tim Stevens, uh, there was no injunction that the police had to authorize that. So the arrest and the imprisonment of Pastor Tim Stevens was completely illegal. Now, speaking of arrested pastors, what's the latest with Pastor James Coates of Grace Life Church near Edmonton, who spent 35 days in jail for breaking provincial health orders during the pandemic? Well, Pastor Coates had his first two days of trial on May 3rd and May 4th, and the uh, trial is going to continue in the month of June. What's interesting is that the Alberta government, after 13 months of lockdowns, uh, did not produce any medical or scientific evidence in court on May 3rd or 4th, and is trying to dr drag this out, trying to stall this for as long as possible. So the government is terrified of having to actually uh, show the court and show the public, uh, is there really a scientific basis for these lockdown measures? And they're running away as fast as possible. But sooner or later in the trial of Pastor Coates, it might not be till July or, or August or, or September, but the government will be forced to actually produce medical evidence and scientific evidence in court to try to justify these uh, public health orders that are violating our charter freedoms. Coming up, there's something occurring in a lab at the University of Lethbridge that's making a breakthrough in the future of medicine. That's right after the break, stay with us. Welcome back. We've heard a lot about the Pfizer and Moderna COVID vaccines lately, but it turns out that there's a small group of biochemists and researchers right here in Southern Alberta who have developed technology that measures the vaccine's RNA loading efficiency. That's that little catchphrase we've been hearing about lately, RNA, which stands for ribonucleic acid. In case you want a science lesson, it's a mo molecule similar to DNA, but unlike DNA, RNA is single-stranded. So there, that's as sciencey as I can get. Well, Amy Henriksen, on the other hand, is a PhD student at the University of Lethbridge who's been researching how Pfizer and Moderna load that RNA into the vaccine. It's really complicated stuff, but fascinating nonetheless because it can't be done any more accurately or with any other technique than what's found in the biochemistry lab at the U of L. In fact, this young lady is so impressive, she's been invited to do an international conference on her work. She joins me now. Amy, welcome to the show. So tell me, how does the research you're doing relate to the world we're living in right now? So when you're making these drugs, lots of the quantification methods right now are harder, they're hard to determine if you have any like empty lipid nanoparticles, so anything that doesn't contain a drug or ones that contain like too much drug or the right amount of drug. So with the technique that we're developing, you're able to accurately determine if there's any empty lipid nanoparticles or if they all contain the drug that you want. Okay, interesting. So how do you see this research being used in the future? Um, hopefully for this, we're actually working on developing what's called um, GMP or good manufacturing practice uh, software and like for the instrument. So what we're hoping is that we can uh, get like, what we're hoping is that we're able to get the software GMP approved, and then it can be used by the drug manufacturing companies to check their uh, drug samples to ensure that they're all accurately loaded. Okay, now you're an impressive young lady, and my understanding is that you've been invited to go speak on some of the, the research that you're doing, right? Yeah, yeah, so Beckman, uh, Beckman Coulter recently invited me to speak at a conference in Europe called the Gene Therapy, uh, sorry, yeah, gene therapy analytical development in Europe, which is super exciting. So there I'm talking about the LNP uh, AUC paper that we recently published, as well as some work on adeno-associated viruses that, we, that we've been working on. And they also invited me to talk at one of their Beckman symposiums. Well, I wish you all the best, Amy. Thanks. <laughs> Now, Dr. Boreas Damler heads up that chemistry and biochemistry department at the University of Lethbridge, where Ms. Henriksen's been doing all of her research. He joins me now. Dr. Damler, please tell us why this particular work is so important. So, I mean, I don't have to explain how important it is that everybody gets vaccinated uh, against COVID, for example. 
And so these Pfizer and Moderna and AstraZeneca vaccines, they're all injected into a person. And so I would think everybody would be uh, happy if they got something that was uh, properly vetted before they <laughs> get it injected into their body. And this is something that we can do. Uh, we can tell exactly how many contaminants are in there, how pure the preparation, how homogeneous the preparation is, and whether it contains the necessary uh, drugs that are to be delivered. Uh, so our technique can probably do this better than any other technique out there. And the fact that we have that here in Lethbridge, you know, kind of uh, gives us uh, a very attractive, um, I guess, center uh, to manage where lots of people or lots of companies would like to send their samples for analysis. And so we work with many groups that uh, are not necessarily in Canada, um, that uh, especially biotech companies that produce uh, vaccines, monoclonal antibodies and um, formulations that are injected into people and they send us samples uh, to characterize the, them for them. And so we work with groups in England, in Germany, in the US. Um, we work on uh, other projects with groups in Costa Rica and Brazil. So it goes all over the world. And um, before I came here, I already had a lot of collaborations going on, which I brought with me. So we have also academic collaborations with, with professors in uh, uh, all over the US uh, mainly, uh, but also abroad. And so this, this puts us really uh, on the map, I would say. Dr. Dame Miller and Amy Henriksen, thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it. We need to take a quick break, but keep it right here as we take a look at some of the top local stories of the week. Welcome back. There's a new initiative between Tabor Police Service and Lethbridge College. It will allow students to sponsor themselves into police training. As BCN's Naveen Day explains, it will make candidates easier to recruit by a police service after completion. Lethbridge College and Tabor Police Service are launching a new initiative that will allow up to six police recruit candidates to self-sponsor their own training at the college's police cadet training program this fall. Tabor Police Chief Grandma Bella says the training will be hosted at the Tabor Police Service and give candidates a much needed competitive advantage. Normally, uh, Lethbridge Police Service or Medicine Hat Police Service are in position to be able to host uh, the academy and all of us send our recruits to that. Uh, this year, uh, Medicine Hat and Lethbridge don't have uh, much need for training, uh, but some of the smaller police agencies do, for example, us and the Blood Tribe Police Service. So as a result of that, um, we've decided to host this training ourselves. Dr. Janine Weber, who is the Dean for the Centre of Justice and Human Services at the college, says students who pay for their own training rather than be sponsored by a single police service will have higher ready options available to them when it comes time to join the force. If new positions come available in some of the other police services in Alberta that are not available at the beginning of the training, they would be able to apply and be able to be hired. Uh, whereas when it's only sponsored spots, it's what's happening is it's only the known positions at that time that police services are obviously uh, recruiting for and selecting appropriate candidates. The Tabor Police Service will be sponsoring two new recruits to enroll in the program in the traditional method and also offer the opportunity for up to six self-sponsored students to obtain the credential. Weber praises the collaboration as an incredible initiative to bridge the field with academics. It's just a great example of how we can leverage each other's strengths and really help to prepare people for um, their career. I know as a, as a small police agency, if I can get a sponsored candidate who's, who's themselves paid for their own training, their own education in order to, to apply to my police service, that's definitely you know, something that I look at as an, that would be an advantage to that person in my competition. The college's police cadet training program was launched in 2017 and was recognized with the Gold Program Excellence Award by Colleges and Institutes Canada in 2018. For Bridge City News, I'm Naveen Day. 
The provincial government recently announced they'll be offering rapid antigen COVID-19 test kits to all Chamber of Commerce in Alberta to help nonprofits and business owners screen for the virus. The Lethbridge Chamber of Commerce will be res responsible for distributing these tests to local businesses. The chamber hosted an information session for its members to discuss what the rollout will look like. From the information that we've received is that they they're they're solid tests, but that is why it's important it is important to use the tracking system because if there was a lot that you know is off, that is why those tracking systems are in place. Unfortunately, nothing's ever, especially in testing, nothing is ever a hundred percent perfect. But um, the results that they've received so far is th that they. They're, they're excellent, and that's why they're standing by this specific test that they're sending us. Students learning from home and at school are set to receive some much-needed equipment. The Evangelical Free Church of Lethbridge has donated 40 Chromebooks to the Lethbridge School Division. As Micah Quinn explains, six schools within the division were given these much-needed gifts. The superintendent of schools for the Lethbridge School Division, Dr. Cheryl Gilmore, says the division is grateful for the donations and students will be able to put the Chromebooks to good use. As we've experienced all year long, there's periods of time when classes are in quarantine or individual students are in quarantine. And of course, we shift back and forth. And so having accessibility to technology is really important. Even when we're learning in school now, technology has become a real seamless part of what we do in schools. And so it's a huge benefit to these students. The Minister of Community Engagement for the Evangelical Free Church of Lethbridge, Monica Lowen, says the church is serving when they have the opportunity. The e Free Church has had a great relationship with the Lethbridge School Division for the last number of years. Uh, getting involved with the Poverty Intervention, Com Intervention Committee, wanting to support families and students in our community. So when we were approached to, about the need for technology for some of the students in the division, we were happy to help. Our mission is to share the hope of Jesus, and we want to be able to do that through meeting tangible needs. The principal of Galbraith Elementary School, Sandy Sheldrup, says this donation allows kids to get technology into their hands when they would have never been able to afford it otherwise. In fact, I have immigrant services getting some translators together so that we can translate to the parents and show them how it works and uh, they can get on with their learning. Many of these families have um, using cell phones that are going between um, multiple members of the family and uh, now this means Five more of my kids are online. Lowen says one in five kids in Lethbridge lives in poverty and in education is the first step in moving kids out of hardship. Thank you, Micah. After the break, Hal Roberts finds out what's going on in Exhibition Park this summer. Keep it right here. The city of Lethbridge is pretty excited to see shovels in the ground as construction of our new agri-food hub and trade center begins at Lethbridge Exhibition Park. Joining me now to chat about it is the CEO of Lethbridge Exhibition Park, Mike Workington. Mike, welcome to Bridge City News. Thanks for having me, Hal. I appreciate the opportunity. Now, can you give a bit of an overview of how long the construction will take on the expansion and when will it open? Absolutely. So we, we kicked off with our, with our formal groundbreaking at the end of March and we're going to construction will take right through until December of 2022. We anticipate that sort of grand opening moment when the public can come see it and, and uh, see all the different amenities that it includes in early 2023, hope, hopefully in the spring of 2023. Um, over the next couple of weeks, you will see some different things happening. Obviously, right now, if you come past the park, you'll see the earth is being moved significantly. We're, we're elevating the building up to the, so that the, the bottom floor of the building has views of Henderson Lake. And so it will be at the same level as Parkside Drive. As we move into the summer months, you'll start to see the foundation piles come in. And then in the fall, you'll start to see the steel superstructure take shape. So it's really going to happen quickly. And then all of a sudden, next year, we'll be in an enclosed building and, and it will have that full shape. Now, with a project of this magnitude, Mike, we're probably talking big bucks. What's the total cost and where's the funding coming from? Absolutely. So the, the total project budget that we're working in is $70.6 million. And so uh, the province came forward as part of their Alberta recovery plan with the, with the COVID-19 pandemic with $27.8 to support an infrastructure build here in southern Alberta. 
Next, the, the city of Lethbridge came in with 20, a $25 million grant. And then over the next 30 years of operations, us at Lethbridge and District Exhibition are financing the remainder of the building, um, which is about $17.8 million. So how many Lethbridge jobs will this actually create? And how much money will the new facility potentially bring to our local economy here, Mike? Sure. So um, the, the early estimates were that about 365 construction jobs would be created here in, in the local economy. And we've been very consistent with wherever possible, um, providing equal opportunity to local trades to build this building. We've been very proud to say that we've partnered with War Brothers Construction, a local construction management firm to manage this project. So we truly are trying to keep as much of this money in our economy as possible. Where we anticipate this growing to, uh, in terms of economic development that the building will bring, we see that around, we see it around a $20 million increase in an annual impact for the community from what we do today at approximately 74 million. A lot of people question me on what does that actually mean and how is that gonna reflect in the day to day? And so what that actually means is that people are going to be staying in hotel rooms. People are going to be eating at local restaurants. People are going to be shopping in the stores here and spending money at the gas stations as they come into town. The biggest change in our business operating model as we go forward to this new building is actually that we're looking outward. So traditionally, Lethbridge and District Exhibition has done a lot of regional events and it's been a gathering place for the, the region and the community. It will continue to be that but we're, we're going to expand that to the provincial and the national and potentially even some international visitors coming into the community to, to spend dollars here in the local economy. So Mike, what new features would the new building have? And specifically, will they still have small rooms available and how big will the largest hall be? Sure. So it, one of the main things that we were missing in our existing facilities was the ability to provide breakout space for our larger shows and some of that amenity space that comes with larger uh, convention and trade centers in larger markets. And so what this building has is four main trade halls, and I'll talk about the size of them in a minute, three, three um, main level salons that are collapsible into one larger one that's about 13,000 square feet. We have four meeting rooms on the main size, on the main floor, excuse me, that are approximately 1,000 square, square feet each. Those also open up into one um, much larger room capable of holding larger meetings, galas, um, larger events. On the second floor, we have the Lakeview Salon. And it's about a 300 person gala space that looks out over Henderson Lake. This will be a marquee spot in, in, the, in Southern Alberta, not just in Lethbridge. And then we've got the rooftop patio that's off of the Lakeview Salon. But shifting back to the trade halls, um, each trade hall, they're identical in, in, in shape and size. Each are a little over 28,000 square feet. And so to put that into perspective, when they're opened up into one contiguous trade hall, all of, this, all of the space that's in the existing pavilions at Exhibition Park will fit inside just that trade hall space in one, in one large room that has three pillars only. It's, it's mostly a clear span room and it's, uh, it's a trade hall space like Southern Alberta hasn't seen. So what will the interior and exterior decor and theme actually look like? Sure. And so this is actually, it's, there's been a ton of time spent on these details. And so one of the more unique things I want to say is um, one of the unfortunate things about the early stages of this construction is that we had over 200 old growth trees here on site um, that had been planted in the early 1900s for the World Dry Farming Congress. And unfortunately for this building, a lot of those were beyond life. Um, a lot, when we brought the building up to elevation, as I spoke about earlier, weren't gonna survive that, that impact. And so what we did is we wanted to ensure that we were recycling these. And so uh, we're happy to say we, we have over a hundred different elements in the, in the design that will incorporate um, the wood from those trees into furniture components around the building. So there will be a strong wood aesthetic throughout the building. But our architects and our interior designers focus on th three key themes, the agricultural of the, of the region, the coal mining history of the region, um, and the railroad that comes through, um, 
comes through Lethbridge and has obviously been an important piece of our history here. And then woven into that are, are bits of history of Lethbridge and District exhibition. For example, the bleachers of, from the South Pavilion in the existing pavilions are being incorporated into the new building. Um, and there's unique design elements. It's an industrial feel in there, but uh, exceptionally modern and going for a very open, um, going for a very open concept with public space. And so the other unique feature about this building is that it will have a, a, a public food court space. It will have up to five commercial retail units in it that we can, uh, we can service the public on a, on a Saturday morning as they're walking around Henderson Lake. They can come in for a coffee, sit on our patio and look out over the lake. That sounds great. Now, so with the expansion doubling the current capacity for events, Mike, you're hoping to attract new customers and events. Do you have anything booked for the future already that you can tell us about? Uh, so we're currently in the process and in multiple discussions with a lot of different event producers. Obviously, given what's going on in the world right now, it's no one's really looking to commit to too many events. However, those discussions have started and we are looking to uh, to begin that process shortly. Now, do you know yet if Whoop Up Days will move ahead this year? So this is the million dollar question that I keep getting asked. And so take COVID-19 away for, for a second. And, and I want to talk about the impacts of the construction on the park. And so we knew that if the building went forward, that Whoop Up Days would look different. And the main reason for that is that currently the, the majority of our, of our um, grass surface here at the park uh, is is part of the construction site. Now a lot of that will come back in landscape manicured grass area that can that will be uh, usable space for future events, but we won't have access to that until we open the building in 2023. Now layering on uh, COVID-19 and what that what that has meant for us is that there's a there's a component of our of our buildings that isn't uh, accessible currently to us in an event planning mode because we, we're, we're happy to host the uh, AHS vaccine clinic here at the park. And so uh, whoop up, something will happen around whoop up days. The, the other challenges that layer into this is there's a bunch of different jurisdictions um, that, their, that their social gathering restrictions come into play. For example, our midway comes out of BC the majority of the entertainment comes out of the United States. I think everybody knows uh, the challenges we're currently living through when it comes to, to travel and it comes to um, bringing people into the community. So there's part of a wait and see going on. However, we're planning many activities for the community right now uh, in the hopes that we are able to open up and do something for this community. After all, we're in the business of bringing people together, but we need to make sure we're doing it in a safe and responsible way. Sorry, I was just going to ask you, so once the expansion is finished, Mike, how will it really impact Whoop Up Days? Uh, so once the expansion is finished, it'll actually provide more space for Whoop Up Days. Uh, for example, our stormwater pond to the south of the building uh, will be a bowl, uh, uh, it'll be a manicured bowl where we can actually hold festival -like, a festival-like environment in there plus the Midway traditionally in its location at the South parking lot. So uh, one of the design features that we focus incredible amount of time on is ensuring the functionality of this park for all types of events, but namely our signatures to ensure that Whoop Up Days isn't impacted in the future. But in the short term, there may be some impact to what people are used to, but we'll come back with a vengeance in 2023 to ensure that we're throwing a proper gathering for everybody. So what are the plans for this year's trade shows? Will they again have to be held virtually? You know what? I wish I had the answer to that, Hal. Um, last year when we, when we did our budgets in the fall, at that point in time, we could do trade shows. There, were, there, were a, there was a specific um, level of restrictions that needed to be in place, occupancy controls, things like that. Um, under, under the current measures, we're not allowed to do any of that. So there's a bit of a, a moving target with that as well. However, uh, we do hope that we are able to bring those, those events back to the community next year. But at this time, we don't know what they'll look like, unfortunately. Now, you do have some interesting events planned for this year, including a program called the Southern Alberta Table. Can you explain what that's all about? Yeah, absolutely. So this, this was a very specific uh, targeted 
group of events actually it, to draw tur tourism to Southern Alberta around a celebration of agriculture. Southern Alberta has so many incredible qualities. Um, through the top three that come to mind for us are really the three main agricultural ones, sun, soil, and uh, the opportunity for water rights here in Southern Alberta. And, and so Southern Alberta Table is a celebration of the producers that make that come to life every day. Um, there's four main events. One, we're kicking it off with a barbecue judging um, class because if you're anything like me, Hal, everyone I know, it seems, got into barbecuing and smoking meat during COVID. And so um, it's become an incredibly popular thing. And so we've actually seen some really good uptake on the judging class. Now, at this time, we're, we're currently trying to figure out how we can manage that with the restrictions if they go any longer than they are. But the, the next event in July is the more unique one that's coming to Southern, that's coming to Southern Alberta, and that's the Smoke, Wind and Fire Barbecue Contest. It is barbecue competition, excuse me. It's the only one of its kind in Canada in July. Uh, due to the restrictions, we're gonna be the first one in Canada this year. Uh, and it is truly a thing that's, that's gaining a ton of momentum um, for, for your everyday backyard hobbyist barbecuer. So we've got up to 24 professional teams that we're hoping to bring in, into the community, all entirely social distanced. Uh, at this point in time, the, the event doesn't have that festival atmosphere because of the restrictions, but we are looking to turn this one into an annual. Uh, and then the more unique piece that I, I hope everyone kind of comes in for the local bragging rights for who is the best pit master in town is the backyard barbecue competition, which, which uh, hits against each other. Your, your everyday backyard bandit on the grill uh, into the ultimate showdown for chicken and ribs. So we're excited to see what comes out of that for sure. Exciting times ahead, absolutely. Thanks so much for being with us today, Mike. It's Mike Workington, the CEO of Lethbridge Exhibition Park. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Al. I appreciate it. Natural treatments for our health and well-being are becoming more popular today, but how many of us are aware that plants can help us fight cancer and that this may be happening right here in our own backyard in Southern Alberta. Joining me to discuss this is Dr. Roy Goldstein. He is the director of the Cancer Cell Laboratory and the Natural Product Laboratory at the University of Lethbridge. He's also the vice president of the Natural Health Product Research Society of Canada. That is a mouthful. Dr. Goldstein, welcome to the show. It's good to have you on today. Thank you. So thank you for having me today. Of course. Now, first of all, can you share what you and your team are doing with your research into the possible health benefits found in some of the, of the local flowers and plants that are growing right around us here in Southern Alberta? Sure, that's right. What I can tell you is that, um, as you mentioned, we, we are a research team at the University of Lethbridge. And um, for a few years now, we've um, decided to look very, very closely at the plants that grow in this area, and then to see if they have any medical properties that might be useful for, um, well, for patients largely in cancer, but also in some other domains as well. This is a, it's an area now that we've been in for about seven years. That's interesting. So I know I didn't realize this, and maybe many of us didn't associate plants necessarily with fighting cancer. So what type of plants can have that potential cancer fighting ability? Well, in, in fact, um, it turns out that um, the plants really are the best medicines in, in many cases, and especially in cancer. Prior to joining the University of Lethbridge, I used to work in the pharmaceutical industry. And so um, I'm sort of attuned to the idea of looking at plants in the first place. But really, it is that the number one, the number two, and the number three cancer medicines in the world come from plants. And so, of course, that, that makes it a, a bit more obvious knowing that, that, that maybe we need to look at some of the plants, you know, in, in this area as well. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, you say that your mission is to find 
all the chemicals in all of the plants. So have you been able to find any new plants over the last year with potential cancer fighting chemicals? And I hear that you're even putting drones to use in searching for these plants. <laughs> that, that, that's right. We, we've been um, we've actually been moving to a number of new technologies to work us um, to help us work through this. In fact, but but in fact, it, it turns out often um, at least in the area where where I work, it, it's sort of in the scientific domain. When people think about plants, what they do is they tend to think of the tropical regions such as the Amazon. And there's a lot of scientists who have gone to that area to look for plants. And, and then as it turns out, there was an idea that came um, with a colleague of mine, Dr. Sophie Kernis, who's at Lethbridge College and my laboratory about seven years ago, with some of the experiences that we've had working elsewhere, we realized that the plants from this area, from Southern Alberta, have not really been studied. But in fact, um, there's some really good scientific reasons why maybe, they, why maybe they should be. And so we launched a number of pilot studies and it turns out those pilot studies were very, very interesting right from the very beginning. And indeed, we have found some plants. We found some chemicals inside those plants that I think that are really on, on a start to, to an interesting path. Yeah, it's interesting that you have a collaboration with Lethbridge College in which I've actually had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Kernese. So that was pretty fascinating as well. Now, Dr. Colstein, you've spoken with local indigenous people here about some of the use of traditional, their traditional uses of native plants species. So which plants have they used as potential healing methods? Yeah, that's right. That, that's, that's a very important point. Because when I mentioned that, I, when I say that not a lot is known about the plants in this area, what I'm really saying is not a lot of scientific information is known about the plants from this area. But in fact, the, um, the First Nation peoples who live here from the Blackfoot Confederacy, there's actually two tribes with which we work, the Kainai and the Pikani. We actually contact them right at the very, very beginning of this project. Because as, as you just mentioned, they, they actually know quite a bit about the plants. And, and it's been very, very interesting for us at a number of different levels. What we've been doing is um, we've been consulting with them on some of the plants and, and we work with one. We actually, um, they've asked us to be using the Blackfoot name on these. So sometimes we don't even know the Western scientific name. In one case, there's a plant that's called, if I pronounce it correctly, it's Semanitis. And this was brought forward to us from a student at the University of Lethbridge and an elder working, working with her. And we've been fortunate to the University of Lethbridge and I'll say Lethbridge College too. Um, both of these centers really, really support the, this, um, this type of work and have been quite involved in, in trying to bring these two views, that of the, of, of the First Nations and also that of, of scientific research together. What a great idea. That's absolutely fantastic. Now, here's a name of a plant that I really like. What can you tell us about the brown-eyed Susan? Yes, I, well, as it turns out, we can now tell you quite a bit. We've been working on this plant for a number of years, and it really was one of the first ones that captured our attention. Um, so so that's, a, that's a very striking plant. It'll be blooming in this area. Well, we still have a, let's say, maybe um, early July, a little bit of time to wait yet. Turns out that plant, um, so it was known to ranchers and such to be toxic. So we took a look at it pretty early on. And, um, and to our, our happy scientific surprise, we found um, it actually did very, very well in some of the, in some of the starting cancer tests that we did. Um, some of the work that we've done on it, we've isolated the chemical that's responsible for that anti-cancer activity. We're very closely with scientists in University of British Columbia and in Switzerland on this project because it's, it turns out to be this chemical stops cells, cancer cells especially, from dividing. And so we want to know a, a lot more about it. It turned out to be important too because it opened our eyes really to some new problems um, and to some plants in this area that might have similar properties as well. No, that's one of our star plants. That is absolutely fascinating. Are, are, is that being used already in modern medicine or is it kind of just on the on the tip of your research basically right now? Uh, no, it's on the tip of our research. Th these processes are, are, are quite long. That's going to take a few years. We really have to do quite a bit of work yet. And we're bringing in more teams from, um, from other centers to help us to go faster with these studies. When, when I say to, I have to be careful, it's, um, I talk about this as being a potential cancer treatments. It doesn't mean that these, won't, that these aren't medicines. What, I, what it does mean, however, is that they're on the right path to, to getting there. And then they'll be looked at very, very carefully and to see just how good they are. 
Interesting. Now, I understand that the wolfberry plant, also known as the snowberry, is showing signs of promise when cells from these plants are exposed to light. Can you explain how you get the right part of the plant and, and how it needs to be treated to reveal potential use in fighting cancer? Yes, yes. That, that, was, that was a very interesting story for us as well, in fact, because it began someone, um, there is a person who lived on a small farm just outside of Edmonton who actually contacted us. And she said that maybe we should look at this plant and, and she contacted us really at the right time. We had the opportunity and the resources to start that. And what it turns out is that there's a, the plant as the wolfberry or the, or the snowberry, um, it, it too has some very interesting chemicals in it. The, these chemicals probably are going to be more for a different disease. They're going to be um, linked with, um, well, they are linked now with a disease. It's a rare childhood disease. It's called a Pelge Huey syndrome. And, and the reason why that turned out to be very, very important for us and in, in my laboratory and also at the university is that um, we were never expecting that. And so it's teaching us a bit of a lesson that we really need to keep our eyes open and that we really need to look carefully at all the plants are here that are here because we're, we can't really be sure, we can't predict ahead of time what we're going to find. And, and so um, by looking at all of them, and earlier you, you mentioned our mission, that's why we want to look at all the plants and all the chemicals that are inside them. I think we're gonna find some very, very interesting things that way. I think you are too. Now, do you have a ballpark guess as to how long it may take to see these plants actually used to treat cancer? Yeah. Our, our ballpark number is usually around 10 years, in fact. But, um, but, but the pandemic is teaching us a lot of things. Of course, all of us were in the middle of this terrible pandemic. Um, there's, there's been some good news on the science side with that, is that with the pandemic, I think scientists are learning now how to work faster and to work more efficiently. And it, I think as soon as we get through this pandemic, that type of information is then going to move into the areas where my laboratory and other laboratories work. And, uh, and we really, really hope that we can shorten that time by quite a bit. Yeah, I hope so too. And by the way, what kind of responses to your research are you getting from the global scientific community? Well, it's, it's been quite a range. Um, I, I think um, as, as many of us who live in Lethbridge know, I, I think some people, um, many of the people that we were talking about, first they didn't know where Lethbridge or, or Southern Alberta was. So at first talking to them wasn't, wasn't so, so straightforward. But what's been happening is um, really through the work of Dr. Kernese and, and now with the University of Lethbridge, we've been able to talk to more and more people and they've realized that this idea of, of looking at plants that grow in Canada, that grow in areas that we've never really explored before, that have connections with perhaps some of the First Nation communities, they're, really, they're realizing that we actually need to do a lot more work in that area. And um, the last few years have been much more productive um, we now work, as I mentioned, with uh, Brown-Eyed Susan with, in, and with a team in Switzerland, team in UBC. We have another project where we work with a team in Belgium, um, teams in France, and of course, um, more teams in Canada as well. So it's been, it's been picking up quite a bit. And, and I guess, too, part of our um, idea is that we really need to focus on the strengths of the area where we live. Um, maybe people in business, they might appreciate this as well. Global science has also become much more competitive science. So where we find ourselves sometimes competing with large universities like the University of Toronto or the universities in the San Francisco area. Yeah. And so we thought we really need to draw from the strengths that we have here in Southern Alberta, our agricultural knowledge, um, our connections with communities, our plants that are from this area. And I think that's been helping us quite a bit. Now I'm here, I'm becoming much, much more positive. Absolutely, and it's such a great way to put the University of Lethbridge and Southern Alberta on the map too, especially with these Well, European they've been very nations. supportive. Yeah, other yeah. countries that, like you said, hadn't even heard of Alberta. <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah. fantastic. Now, Dr. Goldstein, I'm told that your research also may be put to use for natural cosmetics. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so, so it, it wasn't one of our ideas at the very, very, very beginning. I'm not a person, I myself don't use a lot of cosmetics, <laughs> but um, we, we began to realize just by, um, you know, there, there are stores in Lethbridge that are now promoting cosmetics based on natural products. And we see that in some of the larger shops as well. And then um, we thought, well, you know, maybe some of the plants here might, might be important for that. And, and it turned out we've, we've done some preliminary work. I have a research team at the university who's working on this as well. 
and indeed, yes, the, as we know too, that the plants in this area grow under some very harsh conditions. And so the plants produce chemicals that help them adapt to that. And those are the natural products that, um, that work very, very well in cosmetics. And so we think too, here we're quite optimistic and we have some good scientific data to support that. We think here too, that we might have some very interesting products, maybe for that field. And if I could just add one more part to that, I've noticed too, it's attracted, it's attracted students who maybe aren't so interested in some of the real, some of the physics that comes with, with this or some of the other aspects, but it turns out they're quite interested in maybe some of the wellness areas that come with these plants. And, and these students have now been finding a way to work in research laboratories as well. Yeah, it's fascinating that you, uh, work that you're actually doing there. So I really appreciate you coming on and sharing that with us today, Dr. Golstein. Thank you. No, it's, it's my, my, my pleasure and, um, and I appreciate the interview. Yeah, thanks so much for being with us. Dr. Roy Goldstein is the director of the Cancer Cell Laboratory and the Natural Product Laboratory at the University of Lethbridge. So glad to have him on today. I'm Jeanette Roche on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News. Thanks for watching.